map is by referencing previous exam materials and adding commonly tested concepts to the map as a node. We then take these concepts from the map and turn them into topics for our question generators. Each big topic sourced from the exams will also have subtopics that break that topic down into simpler ideas. This allows the students to either back up to an easier subtopic or try a new variant of the same question when they answer incorrectly. So let's take a look at the map. As you can see, this map consists of many nodes, some gray and others colored. The black stars on the right represent the three main exams that are given in UC Berkeley's Beauty and Joy of Computing course. The colored nodes immediately to the left of these stars are the big topics taken from the previous exams, while the gray nodes are the subtopics. Most of these colored nodes have specific exam questions listed, so we can reference them when writing question generators. You will notice that some of our big nodes, like this one, also have a section called PL. This means that we are already writing a question generator for that topic in Prairie Learn. So let me show you an example chain of nodes. Here you can see that we have a big topic of advanced HOFs, which in turn points to one of the main exams. Let's say the student attempts an advanced HOFs question and answers incorrectly. They would have the option to try another variant of that question, or they can choose to back up one step to nested HOFs. If they choose to back up and still answer incorrectly, they again have the option to try again or back up. If they continually answer wrong and back up, eventually they will reach the beginning of that concept, which defines the important aspects of each of the three main higher order functions. Let me zoom out again. Our goal with this map is not only to have it drive the generating process, but also to eventually give it to students so they can have a roadmap of the course to visualize where they're going or what topics they need to review. I know that at first glance, this map probably looks very overwhelming and confusing to read. To combat this, we intend to give this map to students in sections, so it's easier to understand and less stressful to look at. We want to promote a growth mindset in our students and show them that it's okay to not know a concept yet, so that when they do master a question on the big topic, they can use this map to see exactly what they have learned and accomplished. So now I will pass it on to Irene to talk to you more about Prairie Learn and question generation in SNAP. Hello, SNAPCon. My name is Irene Ortega, and I am the SNAP team lead for computer-based testing at UC Berkeley. In order to see computer-based testing come to life, the ACE Lab at Berkeley adopted Prairie Learn from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the United States. Prairie Learn is a flexible and extensible question asking platform for homework and exams. Multiple answer elements are specifically tailored for STEM courses, which include but are not limited to multiple choice, multiple select multiple choice, fill in the blank, live and dead code, as well as drop down menu. So here's an example of what multiple choice, multiple select element, or in other words, checkbox looks like, as well as the multiple choice element in one single question variant. So as you can see, we can add as many different answer elements as we like in one single question. Prairie Learn is extensible because it can do anything a web browser can, meaning we are not restricted to what Prairie Learn already provides. This includes the snap images that you see here and potentially snap image generators, as well as dead or live snap. So Prairie Learn provides support for question generators, which is Python code that can generate infinite numbers of different questions. Our code uses parameters to randomize new question instances on demand, creating a pool of questions where everyone gets a random variant of that question generator. This helps to curb cheating and eliminates the need to write new questions every academic year or semester. This also allows for instructors to spend more time helping students who are str struggling with the material. Prairie Learn also makes it quite easy for students to report any bugs in the case that there is an error in the code. As much as us developers test our code, there are so many variants that errors can tend to sneak up on us. So the student is able to write a message to the instructor to report the issue, 
and they can just simply click, click on next question if they are taking an exam. So now if we switch to the instructor view, there is an issues panel at the top that will tell you if an issue has been reported and the instructor can then see the message. Now if they click on it, they can see the exact question variant that the student got so, so that they can go in and fix it. Prairie Learn also provides automatic feedback, which gives students a sense of where they stand on the course concept map, instead of having to wait for their graded work, which may take weeks. The feedback comes in the form of a check mark next to your answer input, as well as a submission panel. If the student gets the question wrong, they will be told the correct answer so that they can hopefully learn something from it and will be able to try a new variant of the question. Prairie Learn also provides support for hints, which will now be demoed by my colleague, Gurkran. Hi, my name is Gurkran and I work with Irene on the computer-based testing SNAP team. Okay, uh, what you have here is a demonstration of how you can use Prairie Learn to uh, generate answer hints based on the student's answer. So we have a question here. Um, you are given the list data and the following expression, the map expression, and you're asked, what does this expression return? You have several options here. Let's select any incorrect option, see what we get. Um, what you should see here is some kind of hint that kind of gives an indication of what may have gone wrong. And there you have it. When using map, the resulting list is the same length as the input list. So this one kind of alludes to the fact that without exception in a snap map block, your output and input list length must be the same. Um, it's kind of a trick to help students eliminate certain incorrect answers right away and perhaps also think about why that is the case. Um, let's select another definitely incorrect answer and see what we get. Uh, save and grade. Okay, you see the hint changes. Now the hint says the map block maps over the outcome of a function to a list. Think about what the function here is, what its inputs are, and what gets mapped over. So if you notice, um, this explanation goes a step further than the previous one. This one assumes that the student knew that you know, the input and the output array length must be the same, but still messed up somewhere, got something wrong somewhere. Um, what it now says is that it asks you that, okay, uh, think about what goes into map and what map really does. You know, think about what the function here is, what its inputs are, and what gets mapped over. So it's a step further. Of course, instructors can tailor this response. They can even include other um, possible hints based on what their understanding of their students is. Um, GSS can also do that because GSS tend to interact more with students than instructors do. Uh, but yeah, let's see another variant and see this in action. Okay, so now we have a keep expression here. And again, the same thing. And it says, what does this expression return? Let's select um, another definitely incorrect answer. Um, save and grade. Okay, so now the explanation says, uh, the key block acts as a filter. It only adds an element to its in output list when the element makes the predicate within it true. Think about what the predicate here is, what its inputs are, and what keep filters out. So this one kind of goes into the inner workings of keep. You can't really use the explanation that, you know, the input, they can't use the input length as uh, any kind of barometer, barometer because you know, none of the input lengths are greater than, than keep, and keep can return arrays which are of the same length or smaller. But the point is that um, you can kind of customize these hints however you feel your students, you know, what, what may have gone wrong. Um, I guess this is entirely up to the instructor. Uh, this is just an example of what are the possibilities. Of course, this is much more helpful than a very generic answer answer key hint that you get in the back of exams that you know just kind of give the generic explanation well you know what if the student never even got the first part right what if you didn't get the basics um you know what if they what if they needed something else clarified this kind of allows an instructor to customize it customize that ability uh, and yeah that's uh, that's about it hey y'all this is irene once again what you're seeing here is a snapshot of what prairie learn looks like for instructors our question generators are listed and organized by topics, which you grab from our concept map. We also have tags that distinguish question generators from one another. So we distinguish formative versus summative assessment questions, the type of exam the question came from, and the beauty and joy of computing, we call quizzes quests, and we also have a midterm and a final. We tag the difficulty level of the question, the um, answer element that the, that the question uses, um, in this case, radio means multiple choice. Uh, we tag the stage of completion of the question, 
release means that students cannot use the question. Alpha means that it's, it has just been developed and a TA needs to review it. And beta means that a TA has reviewed the question and an instructor now needs to give its blessing for students to use. We also have other identifying tags, uh, such as the leaf nodes that, are, that go under um, the topic in the concept map. So here under logical procedures, so we have tag, set procedure, and global variable. So these tags add an extra layer of filtering and make finding questions easy for instructors and TAs. The search bars at the top help us search for specific tags and topics when creating an assessment. So here we can um, filter iteration questions and we can also um, filter formative questions in the case that we want to make a homework. And of course, we can also um, add multiple filters and filter iteration formative questions only or iteration summative questions only. So these topic and tags are user definable. So we have customized these specifically for the beauty and joy of computing using the 30 colors that Prairie Learn provides. So Prairie Learn structure consists of nested directories of text files. The top level directory represents the course, in this case, the beauty and joy of computing. We use the version control system Git for development so we can edit files locally or on Prairie Learn. On the image here, you, you can see the files for one single question generator. Notice how they are nested inside of the course directory. So within each question generator's directory, there is a metadata, metadata file where we put the name of the question, the title that the students see, and the corresponding topics and tags. There's also an HTML file that allows for anything a web browser allows, and a Python server that dynamically generates question variants by randomizing images and parameters. So now we'll be passing the mic on to my colleague Maxon to talk more about the benefits of computer-based testing. Hello, my name is Maxon, and I'm one of the members of Dan's research team, as well as the current summer instructor for CS10. And I'm here to talk about um, some of the reasons why we're so excited about integrating Prairie Learn both this summer as well as in the near future for 10. So main things that I'm going to be talking about really are is the opportunity that Prairie Learn allows us to support targeted scalable mastery learning for all students, um, allows us to conduct simple secure remote exams so that way we have minimal proctoring necessary while ensuring maximal integrity to the exam. And most importantly, we hope that the model, the opportunities that CBT, uh, Prairie Learn give us um, allows us to deliver a future where all students are able to get A's and do well in CS10 at their own pace. So mastery learning, the main thing I really want to emphasize here is that, you know, providing students with feedback and good questions can be particularly difficult, um, mainly writing new questions. Um, but with um, Prairie Learn, we can take good questions and modify parameters to them. And so that way, not only does the work put into one question um, deliver value for one student, it can del deliver value for hundreds of students, um, even within the same semester, just because of all of the different variants that you're able to give with this problem. And students are able to repeatedly attempt um, different questions too, um, depending on which ones they're working on or the given problem set that week. Um, and by doing this, students can really get a sense of, you know, where do I need some work on? Where, where do I need more practice with? And the best part is we can provide them with that practice. And just to give you a sense of what students would be seeing, too, this is an actual interface. And again, students would be able to, you know, give an attempt, things like that. And that's definitely not correct, but it's okay. Um, usually, or in the future, we plan on integrating more feedback um, into these questions. Um, this is something you can program into Prairie Learn. Um, and that way students will be able to attempt a question and depending on the response, get some targeted feedback, um, tailored feedback, I should say, for, for their particular answer. And once they process that, once they've had a moment to kind of take it in, see where they went wrong, they can just click and get a new question out of the click of a button. It's amazing. And another factor is what if students didn't have to just um, figure out on their own, where, where do I need more work on? Um, with our underlying concept map, we're able to link different question generators and their topics together. So we get a sense of 
here are some prerequisite questions that you need to work on before you should attempt this question. And in some prior research, uh, prior work with Dan, um, we, we worked on this thing called auto quiz, or I didn't work on it personally, but there's some, been some work into a thing called auto quiz. And that was specifically for delivering targeted recommendations for exam questions. But we didn't have access to things like question generators in the past. We just had a giant pool of questions that students were actually able to uh, exhaust. Uh, and this is over decades of questions being accumulated so now we won't have that problem, but we will have the opportunity to deliver as much um, practice as possible um, with the best possible recommendations to students. Another really great thing is the opportunity that we that Prairie allows us to deliver synchronous timed exams. Now, synchronous timed exams um, is essentially where you have um, one fixed time, everyone takes it, um, but all on uh, and all on Prairie Learn. So. Uh, Parallel has a really awesome system where you can set access policies really easily for different groups of students. And you can accommodate different groups of students really easily too. So this is kind of what you would see on the back end of um, a course, not necessarily Parallel, but of a particular assessment, I should say. And so here, for example, right, uh, I have, uh, I've given access a bit earlier to my TAs, for example, to this particular exam. And then they'll be able to provide some feedback and get started on them early, no problem. Now here I have some special cases of students, for example, that say maybe they need bigger time accommodations because of disabilities or um, other unforeseen circumstances, for example. Um, I can provide that access to them too, just by specifying another policy, uh, another access policy. And here um, I have students that are taking the exam at a slightly different time. And this is most likely because they come from a different time zone. Again, I don't have to worry about the logistics of how am I going to deliver this to students who need more time or who are halfway across the world, for example. All I have to do is encode some, um, encode some policies, set the parameters for the exams, and all they have to do is sign on and take it. And for everyone else, they can just take it at the normal time um, that everyone else is taking. And so this is, so this is an example of synchronous time exams because even though we have people different different people taking exams at different times, they're all taking it together. And Prairie Learn combined with, um, you know, having some time constraints, as well as the randomized questions, really cuts down on the opportunity people have for cheating because they don't have time to look up different resources. And there's no point in collaborating with your friends if all of your questions are different from each other. So we've, we, we can essentially deliver probably the most secure possible exam in a remote setting with essentially the least amount of effort and accommodations required from um, the staff side of things. And the goal of all of the stuff I've just talked about is we ultimately want to be able to support a model of learning where people can, people experience fixed learning, meaning they understand all the content, but across a variable amount of time. Students should not be limited to learning within a semester. If they want to take another semester, knowing that at the end, they'll be able to master everything, they should be allowed that opportunity. And we really think that CBT is the best way to deliver this format because now students have a visual and have a, have, both have a visual of where they are. Um, they have a, essentially an endless amount of practice. And in the future, when we have specific facilities for conducting um, computer-based testing, they can just stroll in at any time, assume they've made an appointment to take the exam. And they can go at the course at whatever pace they'd like, whether it's way faster, shorter than the semester, or taking a bit more time to really get to know the content, um, maybe over a semester or two. And in the future then, teaching staff too will be focused a lot less on you know, logistics and how do we get everyone together and conduct an exam, for example, or how do I put together another worksheet? Instead, these questions, the logistics are mostly handled for us and we can just focus on the teaching uh, and, and the experiences and building the relationship with the students and helping them get through the content and really understand it at a compelling level. So that's the goal. Um, that's all I have. Thank you for listening to me. Hello, my name is Max, and I'll be talking about contributing to Prairie Learn. Um, so if you don't know it already, uh, you should join the Prairie Learn Slack channel uh, on this link right here, prairielearn.slack.com. Uh, so that's where you can ask questions and also uh, just getting up-to-date information on the development of in general. Um, so Predator is a very young and uh, 
software. It's kind of in its early stages. And they're super, super open to new ideas and recommendations from the community. Um, so please feel free to ask questions or even give you new suggestions um, on their channel directly. Um, so um, if you're using Prairie Learn, um, the most common uh, uh, usage of it is to kind of like modify the display using the question.html. Um, and you can find elements for writing or displaying questions um, in the link right here. So when you're contributing to Prairie Learn code, please follow the GitHub PR workflow. Um, and in your PR, you should have an updated code base to implement um, code relevant to your changes and also provide examples um, in, for the uh, implementations you've created and also up to update the documentation. So some of our direct contributions so far from Berkeley is uh, notably none of the above and all of the above in multiple choice, which are implemented so that it works very flexible and can be uh, used you know, in a variety of ways. Um, there's also uh, customizable question choices using JSON file so that it's easier to kind of store and transport your uh, especially uh, multiple choice questions in JSON rather than in, for example, HTML that Prayler kind of uh, prefers. Um, and that will all, the, the same feature will be extended to checkboxes and also drop down in the future. Uh, a small implementation in inline figures. So, well, you go, you'll see it once you actually start using it. And also as well as some documentation that are not, not, not mentioned on the slides. Um, so in the future, we're looking to implement, uh, for example, uh, having more than one correct uh, choices in multiple choice, uh, and also a slew of other uh, new things in development right now and in the talks with uh, developer teams. And uh, before I close off, uh, I'd like to just shout out to the Paradigm team. Um, they're really welcome people, very talented, and uh, I think working with them has been a great experience on our side, and I hope you also enjoy working with them as well. Thank you. Thank you all so much for watching our video and attending our panel session. We would now like to open the floor to any questions y'all might have. So I saw a lot of questions going through, a lot of them were answered. Uh, any of them, feel free to un, un, uh, turn on your mic, unmute yourself if you'd like to repeat your question for the team. Oh, okay. Before we move on, um, I believe there was a question asked earlier about, you know, if you can generate these things in code, especially for Snap. So I guess people take different approaches on this, but what I did was that, um, and it's kind of two parts here and Maxim can answer the second part about generating images. But uh, when you export a Snap file with your custom blocks, maybe you can use them as a template. It comes out an XML. So within that XML, you can edit certain fields, which if you import back into Snap will display your question based on the way you edit it in maybe a Python program or any language of your choice. So what I would do is that I would um, kind of generalize some of these fields and then kind of just use a Python program to enter different values in there. And these values would essentially be a new question. Now, last year, Maxon wrote a program which we tested out for a little bit where you could generate images having passed this XML in. I'm not sure where it is right now, but um, eventually what I ended up doing was just kind of importing every file and taking images out. Of course, we intend to find a better way to do it in future, but that's that was my approach to generating questions in Snap with code. Yeah, and um, the problem with this is that it's too slow to generate questions on demand. Um, so what actually happens with our code is that um, we have to open up a uh, snap and then um, dr basically drag and drop the blocks and connect them, then take the script pick um, and export the XML and then parse the XML um, to randomize the components. And so that is just painstakingly long for us to have to do every time we um, generate a question. And that is because we have to put a lot of restrictions on what can be ran like what randomized components, um, like how much randomization can there actually be? Uh, because of course, we don't want to make the question too hard um, for the students and we want it to really hit the concepts that we want, we want them to learn. Um, so I guess the best approach would be to um, come up with some kind of code that doesn't have to parse XML files and um, do it so slowly. Um, because in order to do this approach, we would have to do it 
beforehand, before we release, or as we are developing questions um, and save them into a file for the question generator. So again, um, we are not using this approach right now because it's just way too uh, painstakingly long and uh, we feel like there are better, faster approaches. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, I, oh, sorry yeah. about that. Oh, okay. Yeah, so to add on to that, um, so there is, so right, that was kind of like the hacky solution. Um, there is a way to actually um, uh, directly import XML files in a local instance of Snap, as well as um, directly calling the block editor to do script picks of the blocks. Um, it's just that the solution itself is a little hard to figure out right now. Um, it, it's been done very in a very hacky way before, um, and so. It is possible to do it without the testing software. So we, we use Puppeteer to kind of drag and drop blocks directly into Snap, um, but we, we don't have to do that. Um, it, it, there is a possible, there's a way where you can just call Snap directly in a local environment um, to get these script picks. It's just a bit challenging figuring it out and um, properly documenting that process. So uh, to follow up that uh, question and answer, um... I don't have it right now yet, but uh, as part of like the chain, like what I've been working on is uh, working with both the Snap repo and the Perlang, so that we can incorporate the Snap natively into Perlang as an element. So you can just like uh, write a question right on a Perlang as if like you are actually writing a code in Snap. So I'm like right, uh, going into the details of Snap, like the library. So that like, I will be able to extend, hopefully I will be able to extend the API of Snap itself. And then I like, use the APIs to, uh, use, use the API directly in Perlang to like work with that, whether it is a light snap or the dark snap. So by, by light snap, I mean like, um, you will be able to see all the suggestion like as you are, as you are coding out, oh, like if you put this and then like you get that this result like hint on the plot itself. And then that's not, it's like, just like you're writing your like Python in a plain test, where like you don't get any hint, you're just like writing a code. You don't get any hint or the um, like correction from the system itself. So I'm trying to separate the two features because like on the Snap library itself, those features are all like uh, writing into the, the same library. So somehow like uh, I'm trying to figure out a way to separate the two features and then like we will be able to Im implement it directly into the snap but that's all like for now like that's all like theoretical right now uh, i'm trying to finish this by by fall semester but before the first semester starts so that everyone can start using that but yeah so philip asked are stats kept with each question can you um, see if certain questions are answered incorrectly more often so instructors can re-examine that question? Um, so the answer is yes, Prairie Learn does provide statistics for questions um, individually. So how the class is doing on that particular question generator and also how um, the class is doing as a whole. The only problem is that we don't have a demo of that right now because we haven't actually released it to students, so we don't have any data to actually show. But rest assured that um, Prairie Learn is collecting data on each question so that instructors can know every single day uh, how their class is doing and where they need the most help. This is Dan. I'll just add that we had a meeting with the Prairie Learn developers. And what they suggested is, what if you have a set of variants and not all the variants are equally difficult? What if one, a couple of variants are really hard and a couple are really, really easy? You need instructors to know that to be able to adjust that. So one of the things they're gonna to add to the API is the Prairie Learn system will be able to ask a question, which variant is this? So as you're you know, spinning your random variables to make a random question, you'll also be able to report back to it, say, oh, I spun the variables this way and it's random variant number 17. And then as the student, let's say you have a thousand students, they'll say, look, everybody took version 17 of your randomness, did really poorly, everybody else was fine. You're like, uh oh, something's wrong with version 17. So it's a really great way, once that's opened up to be able to see that you know, 17 is broken or 12 is too easy. So it's, you want to be able to have it all be equally difficult across all the randomness of a particular question. So that'll be really interesting, but that's not there yet, but they're telling us that that'll be there, that'll be coming. And I'm excited to see that. Thank you. Um, okay, so next question is by Nathan Berry. Um, 
his question is along the lines of, could you adapt this down the road for self-learning? I haven't been a high school student for decades. Um, so hopefully our instructor, Maxon, can answer this one. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that last part, but I heard my, I think I heard my name. Um, yes, um, they're ask, uh, Nathan is asking, could you adapt this down the road for self-learning? I haven't been a high school student for decades. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, it was a question about self-paced learning, right? Um, I, I think so. It seems like that's the goal. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about it right now for deployment within college classes. And the goal is, you know, like, let's break away from the semester format where you're stuck in, say, 16 weeks, and that's all the time you get. And now you can kind of go at things at your own pace, um, which is essentially self-paced, you know. Um, and I, I don't see why this couldn't be scaled to independent learners who are kind of doing things on their own, too. Um, yeah, and that that the answer that's a perfect answer. That's what combines with the idea of like how do we how do how does the world get to see this stuff? And so what we probably would do at Berkeley is have this be one of our labs, and our labs are public. You can right now go to Berkeley's page and start playing with our labs. If we integrate these into our labs, then you could see oh like here's an exercise where you're learning how to use let's say map, and you want to teach how to use map in your in your middle school. You could then point them to that lab. It's about an hour and a half activity you could have them use our lab for it and what it'll do in the lab it'll it'll take you it'll be you know embedded infused into the system that i'm learning about map and boom here is some assessments in prairie learn which is just practice 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 on map doing different things so it'd be really from different angles not just write code using map but what does map do predict the output what would the input be that would give you this output all those things that you kind of saw that gurkhorn was suggesting with his hints that'll be there and so that's that'll be a publicly facing thing because that's our practice side when we go to our assessment there might be seep secret questions that Max was talking about that we release only to people who, who actually are getting it when you actually care. But that's just the practice is there. So we're trying to take our questions and actually split them into kind of a little easier ones that might, we might say, well, here's the multiple choice set of answers. And that's the practice series. And then the, the one that's the, the summative assessment might say, fill in the blank for the answer. So it's the same kind of question. It's just a little different. So we're kind of giving away the one that's a little easier where we give you a set of five, but you keep practicing. Same, same question. And then come exam time, it's a little bit harder. Uh, and that's kind of the secret, the secret sauce that we keep, that we keep close to the chest. But yes, the answer is all the practice stuff we'll give away, which we love. Um, then there's this question from Diana Kukerman. So could students potentially, um, uh, is there any like code-based questions? Um, the answer is yes. And I would like to show uh, that Python question right now where students can actually type in code and test their, um, and we, we can externally grade it. So just let me share the screen real quick. So um, can I really see my screen? Maybe you can make the font bigger, just try to increase the size of the okay. window. Sure. Yeah, okay. So basically, um, this is a question very similar to the Fibonacci question. So uh, the only difference is that um, the base cases are different. And then, um, well, um, the linear combination of the previous two numbers are also different. And then we have this table describing um, the first six numbers in this new Fibonacci sequence, which we named this as Nibonacci. And as you could see, students can free write their code freely in this um, blank space. So I suppose um, if we want to, uh, let's just try out a definitely incorrect one. So let's return a negative one. And then when you click seven grade, then this will grade it like really soon. And then, oh, it's incorrect because um, it, it passed none of the tests. But on the other hand, if you actually like put in the correct code, which I um, pre-coded. So this, is, this one is definitely correct. So let, let us just grade it. Oh, then, then everything's correct. So basically uh, the student can write anything they want in this um, piece of blank space right here, and then we can just grade it. And that's um, how we do the code-based questions. Thanks. And you can imagine when he said, every time he said the word Python, think snap. We're gonna have the model so that everything you just saw in Python, you'll have in snap. And that was an example, what, we, what Shane was talking about, of called dead Python, where you can't actually test it. It's not like you have an interpreter and you can play with it, although they're adding that. So you actually will have an interpreter and play with it. Imagine going the same thing with snap. Dead snap means you can click the blocks together, but you can't ever click an expression and have anything. But live snap is like, you can actually practice it, like make a fractal and you can actually be practicing it, practicing it, practicing it. Oh, it looks good. And then you can say submit. So live versus dead means, can you actually get snap to do anything when you click it? or not, that's the live versus dead. And Shane's working on that, we can't wait to see that by the end of the summer. Yeah, I will be 
I believe like I should be able to get it uh, before the fall semester start, like both the uh, extension of the SNAP APM and uh, uh, implementing that in, as an element in the Perilan. Yes, uh, any question, I mean? Uh, Diana asks, do you have some mystery case to avoid back engineering? Um, if anybody, if somebody doesn't have an answer on that, um, Diana, do you want to explain a little bit more? Hi. Um, yeah, so so that the answer cannot be if the input is this, then the output is that. If the input is this, the output is that. If the input is oh yeah, yeah, Kitian, show, show them show them how we thought. That's a that's a great point. That's the first thing we said. Remember, Kitian, your demo. We that's what we said. Well, just put in the put in, put in the array for Nibonacci. Go back and show them how we handle that. It's it's all has to do with the uh, cleverness of the instructor thinking about well, what if they just hard coded the answers for the first five? They just did the table. Watch how watch how we've done. It's exactly that. Okay, so, so, so put, put, in the, put in the return the, yeah, return the thing. No, no, you can just put the code that she's talking about. Return the, you know, uh, a, a list of those things, you know, return, open bracket, minus uh, one. No, you can just do square brackets, square brackets, and then okay. minus one, minus, minus one, three. Three, five. Yeah. And watch, 13. watch. So, so let's say they don't do anything, right? They have no idea what code is, but they know how to, how to fake it. And then uh, 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 open square brackets of n, yeah. So watch. And we thought about this. <laughs> and they, yeah. So basically, um, most of the test cases will fail. So you would only get the these constellation prices per se. So we, we, we give them some points just for getting the base case. We tell them, but then we check random values as well, and they'll miss all of those. So that's the idea here. Yes. Oh, okay. and, and, no, and notice it does an error. Like we check it on NF7. He didn't include seven things in his, in his, in his thing. So that actually caused Python to error. It, it yeah. said like, yeah. but, but, but he just loses the point, it. but it's very clever. But they can do it again, right? Because they can repeat it as many times as they want. So they do it again and they include for seven. Right. So, no, that, well, that's a funny thing. But then here's the problem. If they actually write a recursive routine that just has the two things, you, you can't like, we can't run their code for more than 25 or something. <laughs> so we really can't ask them of a value that's 175 because even if they write it correctly in a, in a recursive way, that would never return. So it's a little bit of a, <laughs> of a tension of how, how big a number do you throw at them? Because if they did it right, you actually can't solve it for more than 25. <laughs> but, if they, but that same student, if they would have hard-coded 25 numbers, they, we can't, we're not going to test you 26 because 26 is too many. So it's a funny thing. Kitty, you want to share? Yeah. Uh, so Diana, just to answer your question. So um, uh, on a summative um, test, for example, like a, a midterm or a final, of course, the student cannot like try again. So once he gets like, uh, he gets one out of like uh, only 10% of, of this question and that's it. But when we're using this question, like for this one specifically, it's only for a formative purpose where uh, students can freely practice their uh, coding skills and et cetera. In this case, um, writing something like as trivial a solution as this one uh, is not um, is not something uh, is not is not beneficial to the student uh, himself. Yeah. And meanwhile, just to uh, add on the spices here, we also have a kind of like a, a summative um, version of this question, which is actually the Tribonacci question. So notice here, uh, it's actually a variant of the original Tribonacci sequence. So it's harder than the Nibonacci, and we we, we want to use this one. Uh, for summative uh, for summative purposes, while the previous one you you just saw, which is the Nibonacci version, as the formative version, and for the Nibonacci question, you could just um, try as many times as you want, but potentially for this Tribonacci question, only one uh, attempt is allowed. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, so to add on to that, um, you mentioned how uh, students can just do multiple attempts and, you know, try to hard code the correct answer. Um, so the way some of the assessments work on PeriLearn um, is that after every attempt, there's a reduction of points. Um, and so if they, if they try once by hard coding it, and then the second time they tried a more clever way of hard coding it, they will lose points as they try it. So that's one way to try to... Um, 
prevent that. But how much they lose is up to the instructor, which is really beautiful. Like that, that system says, you know what, I'm going to let them have 20 tries. You yeah. just put 20 of the same things. It's worth 10 points. You put, 10, 20, you put 20 tens in a row saying for the first 20 times, you lose nothing. But after the 20th time, all right, you just submit. So the point is, you, can, you know, the attenuation curve is up to each instructor for what it is. But you actually have to still put a copy of 20 tens in a row. You can't just say forever, full credit. There is some limit, so, but you have to then just copy that for a long time. It's a funny thing, but yeah. And actually what they found is that you have to attenuate it. Like they, this is a Craig Zillis, who is the UIC lead that we're working with. Um, he says, if you put no attenuation at all, they always get full credit for it. What the students just do, they just keep trying it randomly. Like, like if it's a multiple, they'll just keep trying it. Seven, nope, 18, until they finally get it. Like it's, like it's like trying to break into a lock. When you finally get it, if you don't care, you just keep trying it and you finally get into the lock. You don't care, you get into the lock. And so you ha he finds that you have to have some attenuation for, like you really need to work up to get to it and then try it. Even if it is a summative thing, you could have it even in a summative, they can try multiple times. But you have to have some penalty if you, if you miss it the first time. So that's, that's what he's found. And so maybe it's small, but it's still a little bit just to kind of see, like, don't just try forever and keep guessing. But for formative, I mean, you can have as many as you want. That, that's no limit to that one. I can um, demonstrate some of that or show how it looks like on um, the court, like instructor side, of, side too, real quick. Um, let me see. I, could I ask a question about yeah, Perry Learn? Um, yeah, I had a question about like student data and privacy is, does all the student data go to Prairie Learn or can an institution like, you know, fork an open source copy of it or how does that work? It's exactly the latter. It's exactly you described it. So you, you get it yourself, you bring it yourself, you load it yourself. And what we've done at Berkeley is we've plugged it into our own student information system. Prairie Learn has no idea. We're running it locally. All the data is local. The students have to authenticate in the normal way you authenticate it. And then it's all ours. Uh, and it's all, I mean, it takes some time for the IT people to plug it in the right way. But once that plug happens, it never, I mean, the data never goes to Illinois. This is all Berkeley stuff. And so Berkeley's data stays at Berkeley. So it's, it's exactly right. We're running in our service. It's exactly what you want. You can do it in your K-12 system. It never leaves your K-12 world. It's perfect. Yeah, I mean, I do. It looks great, and but I also hear that it's a new system. So I wonder how long has UCB been using it, and how stable does it seem? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been a U. It's been in Illinois for about five years. So they act, and they have I think forty classes. I mean, the the number of I, I should pull up in this while this talk. I should pull up the number of students that have run through this. I think I remember something like forty thousand students have actually hit this system in different variations over the course of the last five years or so. But they have forty courses running it. I think uh and they've had great success and you know the the development team is feeling it's very stable at this point they're at version three and it's and it feels great for the students point of view they have a system called the computer-based testing facility they have a special room the students have to drop in on we're talking about and at least at berkeley of having this be run in anybody's room you don't have to have a special room on campus that you just you know staff and pay money for we we have a lab where we have our teaching assistants walking around why not have that be the facility so maybe the last half hour of every you know diana and i were talking about the lab that we have of a closed lab you why not have it and that those our students meet twice a week two, two hours a week we were, so we talked about could you have the last half hour be you know the first 90 minutes is just play in lab you're in you know you're learning something you're watching a video you're talking to your friends you're getting help but the last 30 minutes nobody's talking put your phones away and you're in prairie learn so you could do this twice a week and that's in ours and each one of those is you just have a ta making sure that you know the phones aren't out and nobody's talking and so that's kind of like a mini time where it's a very low stakes because each one of it's worth whatever and remember our, our goal is if you get it all wrong on, mon on, on Monday, no problem. Wednesday, you get it also wrong. And next Monday, you get it right there. Here's your full credit. So there's no penalty for ever not learning it in the summative way. We, we, we like that model. So if it yeah. takes you, you know, two years to learn this course, it takes you two years. So that's, we haven't tried it yet, but that's our goal. That's our longer term goal as I talked about in the video. Yeah. And has anybody compared it to RuneStone? Because RuneStone, it, it's an ebook system, but it also has like practice problems and, um, I think they have a new practice feature that I haven't tried yet. Has anybody? I, I, I think they haven't because and there's a lot of, I mean, if you want to do the comparison, there's a lot of Zing, uh, Zybooks is a whole company that has the similar thing where it's all in their, you know, walled garden of how their assessments are and how they do the thing. And each one of these companies has their own thing. This is, this is an open source project with a lot of randomness. And I'm sure a lot of people have that kind of feature, but this is a new, this is a new project from Illinois. So I don't think they've done that. I don't, I haven't seen that comparison. 
Yeah, RuneStone is open source as well. Unlike oh, that's great to hear. Yeah, I don't think Sidebooks is. I know Barbara Erickson uh, yeah. at, at Michigan is a big RuneStone fan and talks about her Python course quite often. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Other questions in the chat people want to try to answer from our team? So Olav is asking in summative mastery tests, can we also use random manual checking afterwards the material was sent in? Um, Olav, do you want to explain a little bit more? Do you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I just have, I, I am a teacher in, in uh, high school and we, had the corona homeschooling period and there was a lot of discussion about cheating so i like very much the idea of of this system but uh, i i f i believe that if there are possibilities to cheat we can uh, anyway say that when they get their l label we can always detract de detract it or take it back if we in the source code of the schooling of the tests find cheating so if the student know that there is a possibility to be, to be discovered, maybe the, we don't have a big problem about it. Um, I think I mentioned this briefly in, uh, at the beginning of my speech, is that uh, the, the beautiful thing about CBT is that it, it already minimizes cheating by uh, um, providing the students with different variants of the problem. So uh, I guess the way we want to uh, resolve the problem of cheating is trying to um, and make sure that there's no motivation at all to to, to actually want to want to see other people's solutions because um two students may be um solving completely different questions even if they're sitting side by side so um they're not able to like actually see other people's code and stuff like that and um one thing one more um aspect we want to like uh, take care of is what if the student actually uh, inputs the code in, in their terminal and try it out on themselves uh, the, the, way, the way we thought about like solving this is having this window of, uh, of parallel open at all times and the students might may, uh, cannot actually like leave the window so that um, it, it also mm. like solved the problem of cheating. Does that answer your question? Yes, actually, yes. But I thought also about back engineering in the, in the way that, the, that such things could be excluded afterwards and if it's necessary. Oh, but I, 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 under I understand that you have uh, thought enough about it. I have another uh, point about cheating is that because it's going to be on like a continuous and based on mastery, a lot of people wouldn't cheat. So like right now, a lot of people are cheating because they're confined into like semesters or something and they do not have enough time for themselves to learn it. So they can't, or like, like there's like many problems that could arise that kind of forces people to cheat in a sense or like makes it more likely for them to cheat but with the the thing that we have set up now or the end goal um a lot of people i feel wouldn't cheat just because they don't have to they could continue and take enough time to learn the material yeah, that's just what I and I, I agree with that. I think if you lower, there's so much stress. If you ask any of our undergraduates on this call how much stress they have in their first couple of years, it's just overwhelming. And if you could do anything to lower the stress, at, you know, this is like not just a stress at the exam, but just a stress over the course. This is a course that just wants to support you. It's what's called the beauty and joy computing for a reason. We believe there's beauty and joy in learning code and there's not beautiful and joyful things when you are sitting at an exam and it, your whole life and death is for if you do well or don't do well on that particular exam. So we want to just reduce that stress, allow the exam to be all continuous throughout the year and eventually if you end up learning it and mastering it with the a plus as they talked about a year from now that's great that's great so we want to celebrate that so there shouldn't be any penalty for having for being a little bit slower learner for this stuff which is hard computing is hard for beginners so so we we, we love this idea of, of being able to reduce the stress for all exams and to have no exams. The other thing with the pitch is everybody gets an A plus and no more exams. Because these little things in Chamber Prairie isn't really an exam. It's just a little time. It's like in Khan Academy. You're just in there. You're playing. You're getting it wrong, but no big deal. You're learning. You're getting hints. You're getting practice. And you eventually get over the hump, eventually. And so you don't think about it as an exam anymore. It's a really nice way to think about it.
Um, so on the topic, Susan commented, when I do that, sometimes the students who work hard and get it earlier resent that others can do equally well. Should there be any penalty for later? Um, so the answer for that is if a student finishes early and, and they attain mastery early, I mean, it's good for them, you know, now they have a responsibility of their off their shoulders, you know, but I think it's, it's essential for students to understand that not everybody is going to work at the same pace as them. Um, and just because they want to be overachievers and, and, and finish early doesn't mean, I don't think it means that other students should be penalized for taking their time, um, especially if they're just naturally slower learners. Um, so the answer to that is no, there, there should not be a penalty for later. Um, again, the point is for all to reach mastery, for all to get an A. Uh, and if there is resentment, I think that's just something that students need to, you know, deal with themselves. I think that's more like a personal issue. Um, I, I have a question. Um, I figured out that I learned more when I firstly did it not right. Um, and I think it would be a good idea to award somebody to who is firstly not succeeded but uh, kept going and succeeded then. So maybe we can also, so maybe we can um, like build up a culture where failure is not, not, um, not, not bad. That's actually a good thing. So you get awarded for keep going. You've got grit. I love it. That's wonderful. Yeah, I think you, you really hit the topic of like, or like the whole point of this is to, to not be afraid of failure. Yeah, growth mindset. It's all about the growth mindset. Uh, professor, uh, can you talk more about like the, uh, the instructor part or point of view or how like the template, question templates are shared and then like there's a, I believe like a, it's a, there's a, a poem just for the instructor to talk about it. Um, yeah, sure. If you wanted to get into this, and we only have a couple of minutes, I'll just close with, if you'd like to, there's a couple of opportunities to, if people, we got people excited on this, on this, on this call. This is wonderful. Um, one, if you'd like to be, um, maybe hear from us once, I think once we get this, once we get the public facing snap questions, the, 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 the formative uh, ones out there, I think we'll share that with BJC teachers. So if you're kind of on the BJC teachers list, you'll see the list that here's a place to play with and try and how to do this. That's part one. Um, we, we obviously are keeping the ones that are summative to our close to the chest, but if you, if you know, I think Shuchi was reaching out and we certainly know her and happy to have add her to our GitHub so you can see the questions as we're developing them, which is great. Uh, and if there are other master teachers who want access to that, that set, we can work with you one on one to give you access to that as well. Um, and how to install it yourself. There's, we have a lot of onboarding things that our team has, has uh, to how to write more, your own questions. If you want to add your own questions to this. So if you want to grab our repo and, and clone it locally and then add your questions that we could, we could work with that as well. So it's really fun uh, working with this. I want to thank with the, with the one second left, I want to thank our team for this. This is an outstanding presentation. We've got a team of about 15 students plus and minus, and it's really, really delightful to work with these teams. So I want to thank our students for a wonderful panel. Thank you, guys. Woo! Great stuff, great stuff. Also, do know that the forum is open for any more questions about that. We'll try to monitor that and make sure we can get back to you. Thanks, everybody. And please do come to the Minecraft tour and the games in about 10 minutes. Take a stretch and come on back. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you. Bye, folks.